afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon uh, for those people here uh, on site and also those people watching online. God bless us all. So as we open today, I just want to share something that I just learned from my devotion for today and something that is really dear to my heart this week. On my devotion, it said, never give up. There's some famous people there, a um, person named Winston Churchill. And he said on his words, Never give in. Never give in. Never, never, never. In nothing. Great or small. Large or petty. Never give in. Accept the conviction of honor and good sense. Never yield to force. Never yield to apparent overwhelming might of the enemy. We might have experienced a lot of things right now. Maybe it's physical, maybe it's spiritual, or anything else that we're experiencing right now. But God is telling us never give up. Never give up on doing good. Never give up on trusting God's love. Never give up on doing what is right for His glory and for our good. As we are start our service, let's all stand up for over here in the on site and also uh, the one in online. Just join me and let's put our presence and pray to God for our service this afternoon. Lord God, truly Lord, you are wonderful. You are amazing, Lord. You are powerful, Lord, and you can do whatever is good, Lord. And we just have to put our trust, Lord, and obedience to you, Lord. We might not understand things, Lord, in this world. We might not understand everything, Lord, that's happening in our life. But I know, Lord, and we know, Lord, that you know what is the best for us, Lord. Your ways are higher than our ways, Lord. Your thoughts are higher than our thoughts, Lord. And you said, Lord, in Galatians 6, 9, Lord, don't give up and don't be weary of doing something good. Because in the end, if we never give up, we will reap the harvest. Lord, we trust on that word, Lord. And Lord, we might have things, Lord, that's in our mind, Lord. But Lord, just give us, Lord, that trust, Lord, through the Holy Spirit, Lord. And as we start our service right now, Lord, May our worship be, Lord, something, Lord, that is pleasing aroma to you, Lord. Something, Lord, that will glorify you, Lord. That will touch our heart, Lord. That we will not just really be singing songs, Lord, playing instrument, Lord. But we will worship, Lord, in spirit and in truth, Lord. And, Lord, we ask, Lord, as we hear the message, Lord, from our series, Revelation, Lord, that you will reveal to us, Lord, what you want us to do, Lord. There's a lot of things, Lord, that we might not understand your, from your word, Lord. But the things, Lord, that you're going to reveal to us, Lord, are something, Lord, that we should use in our practice, Lord, in our daily life, Lord. May you guide our pastor, Lord. Reveal to him, Lord, your message, Lord. Use him, Lord, as a mighty instrument of your word, Lord. That whatever is going to preach to us, Lord, is not something that's coming from his insight, Lord, but something, Lord, that's coming from you, Lord. What you want us to hear, Lord. Lord, and prepare our hearts, Lord, to listen, Lord, and humble ourselves, Lord, whatever you want us to learn from this message. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Good afternoon, church. Good afternoon. Um, in Psalms 135.3, it says, Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praise to his name, for that is pleasant. So let us worship, setting aside our worries, our own thoughts, but let's focus our minds and our hearts to God who deserves all our praise. Amen.
children of your mercy, rescue for your glory. We cry, Jesus, set our hearts towards you, that every eye would see.
yesterday, today, and forever, oh God. Thank you so much that we can rely on you, can lean on you, oh Lord, and trust you. And all this we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We could have Brother join for offertory. Let's pray for the offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many gifts that you've given us through the years. And Lord, we just want to offer a token of that back. We thank you so much for what you're doing in our lives. May you get all the glory for, for what you're accomplishing. And now we just give you a token of that back. Amen. With a grateful heart, give thanks to the Holy One, give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ, His Son.
Praise the Lord. Amen. <sighs> Isn't it a great time to worship outside today? Amen. You know, the wind, wind in your hair and your face. And, uh, and when you close your eyes and you sing those songs and the sun is in your face as well, it's perfect, right? <laughs> It's really good. Thank you, worship team. Thank you for your for a uh, very uh, blessed time in worship. And I do hope everyone, uh, you know, when, when you come to worship the Lord, sing. Sing with all your heart. Uh, don't be ashamed to raise raise your hands. Um, and those who are here for the first time, welcome. Um, and But I do pray that uh, you feel uh, comfortable being with us. Uh, you know, make them feel at home. Uh, those who are here for the first time. I know we have probably one here on the side. I don't know who else. But I do welcome uh, everyone who are here today. Um, just a few things before we head to our prayer. Um, you know, last night we had a very a wonderful time in our prayer uh, as a church, our prayer meeting. And I do encourage you to join the prayer meeting every Saturday. It starts at 6. And we end at seven. Ideally, end at seven. Last night we ended beyond seven, but uh, I know some of you maybe in the past you struggle because you're concerned that, that someone might, uh, you know, Gabby or whoever's in charge will assign you to pray. I know some of you might be afraid that you'll be assigned to pray. Uh, so that's not a concern anymore. We uh, changed the way we do things last first last night. It was good. So we're practicing a conversational prayer. So basically, just whoever is led to pray, just pray. If you're not, if you don't, you're not ready, then you just stay silent. You, you just agree. Make sure that you agree with someone who's praying. So um, it was very uh, um, engaging, more engaging than the last two approach we did. You know, we tried what we call, uh, you know, the one, the first one where we assign people to pray. The second one, uh, I, I'm sorry, Steve, but this is called. We usually call this the Korean style prayer. <laughs> <laughs> where everyone just prays together at the same time uh, but uh, so that's one but the thing is we struggled are we done it? So, are we finished already uh, what's going on we're not sure what where, where we are in the prayer time so so please uh, join us on uh, Saturday because uh, that is really the powerhouse of the church uh, we need people praying prayer warriors praying and also uh, for the men I'm just going to make a plug to the men's ministry do join us as well we're in the transition point now where it's not only about uh, married men but where it applies to unmarried men so then if you're single do you join us uh, uh, single men join us on Wednesdays at 6 um, and it's a very uh, blessing it's a great blessing the lesson is very, very, uh, very you learn a lot from the lesson uh, and, and change the way you uh, do your uh, job as a dad as a father and also of course as a man um, yeah. and grow, do better mm. let me just read something to you but let me just introduce this you know um, we've been studying Revelation for a while now and and truthfully we're gonna, we're gonna be in Revelation for a while because <laughs> there's so much in this passage in this in this book that I really like us to really take our time in studying but revelation is not just about future events i know most of you know think of revelation as talking about future events that's why you're interested in revelation because you want to know you know the end times and our current events as well how does it fit to revelation but in, but as we studied revelation we find out that this is a revelation of jesus you get to know jesus better and not only that you get to know god Better because the, Jesus is the exact imprint of the Father. So the more you know Christ, the more you know God the Father as well. And so if you want to know God the Father, you know God, you want to know God, know Christ. And, and we see the nature of God in Jesus Christ. It's God's attitude, thinking, you know, uh, the way he conduct himself in heaven. That is exactly who Jesus is. The way Jesus conducted his life on earth is really who God the Father is as well. In fact, in, in John 14, 19, uh, we are reminded here, uh, this is something that, uh, you know, Philip was asking Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it will be enough for us. 
You know what Jesus said? Don't, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? John 14, 19. Jesus is like sacking and praying to the Father. You know, I believe our Christian life, your Christian life, is a reflection on how you know God. It's a reflection of your knowledge of God. I would like to read this quote from Tozer. I've read this before, but I think this really fits well with what we're talking about today. Let me read this to you. And I, want, I pray that you listen carefully. Nothing twists and deforms the human soul more than a low or unworthy conception of God and His kindness. To a Pharisee, to a Pharisee in the days of Christ, the service of God was a bondage which he did not love, but from which he could not escape without a loss too great to bear. The God of the Pharisee was not a God easy to live with. So his religion became grim, hard, loveless. It had to be so. For our notion of God must always determine the quality of our religion. Let me say that again. For our notion of God must always determine the quality of our religion, meaning the way we live our life, especially as believers. Much Christianity since the days of Christ, since the days of Christ's flesh, has also been grim and severe. And the cause has been the same, an unworthy or inadequate view of God. Instinctively, we try to be like our God, and, we, and He is conceived to be, the, to be stern, exacting, so we will be ourselves. You know, if you believe God is stern and exacting, strict, in, that, in a bad way, you become like Him. You become the God of your imagination. From a failure to properly understand God comes a world of un unhappiness among many Christians, even today. The Christian life is thought to be glum, unrelieved of cross-carrying under the eye of a stern father who expects much but excuses nothing. An austere God, peevish, highly temperamental, extremely hard to please. That is how many people think of God today. The kind of life which springs out of such libellous notions must of necessity be, be but a parody of the true life of Christ. Meaning this is all not true. This is not true about God. And this is the conclusion of Tozer. The truth is that God is the most winsome of all beings. His service is one of unspeakable pleasure. Those who trust Him have found His mercy always triumphs His justice through the blood of the everlasting covenant. His mercy triumphs justice through the blood of His everlasting covenant. This is the God of the Bible. He is winsome, loving, serving Him is, is a source of joy and pleasure. Source of joy and pleasure. Let us pray. Father God, Lord, speak to us through your word. Thank you for such a wonderful weather, Lord. Lord, speak to us through your Holy Spirit, Lord. Let me know, Lord, how imperfect I am. I make mistakes, Lord God, but you are perfect, Lord. And Lord, I cannot convince, I cannot bring about conviction in the hearts of people, Lord, whether it's conviction of sin or righteousness, Lord. But Lord, by your Holy Spirit, Lord, nothing is impossible. And Lord, you can also minister to those who are listening online, each one of them, every person who's listening right now. Minister to them, Lord. I, Lord, uh, speaking to Revelation is a bit challenging for many of us, for me as well, Lord. It's challenging, Lord. But Lord, we can learn so much from this. And, and Lord, I pray that it's not just knowledge to fill our mind, but Lord, truth of God that we may obey. Truth that brings about wisdom in our hearts. 
O oh God, to be able to do what you called us to do, Lord, in this life and in the life to come, Lord. Lord, I pray for those who are, are young people here. I pray, Lord God, that you also reveal yourself to them. Lord, there are things that they might not understand fully, O oh God. But Lord, nothing is impossible with you. You are the God who, who, who is the source of all understanding, O oh God. And Lord, you will grant them, Lord, the spirit of wisdom and understanding as well. Among our young people today, speak to their hearts, O oh God. And Lord, those who are not saved today among us, and even those who are listening online, I pray that salvation will come upon their souls. They will know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They will surrender to Him, to His Lordship, and follow Him for the rest of their life. Lord, I, I, just, I, I thank You for this blessing of being able to present Your Word to God today. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. What Tozer said earlier, what I read earlier, this needs to be your pursuit as Christians, to know God. This needs to be your goal. You know, every time you, you do your devotions, you read the Bible, you go to your life groups, these are not random Bible studies, by the way. I know some of you might be thinking, oh, I, I, I enjoy going to Bible study. I, I, oh, wow, what a great devotional time. Your, your end, the end game here is to know God. To know Christ and of course to know God. But the thing is, knowledge of God is not merely intellectual. It's not merely in the mind. Knowledge of God requires obedience. You may read the Bible a million times, but you will never know God if you're not going to obey Him. You may read the Bible a million times, you will not understand the love of God until you experience His love, until you learn to love a brother or sister in Christ, until you learn to invest, to give your life to someone else through discipleship or nurturing a young Christian or caring for another person in Christ. That's the only way you're going to learn the love of God. It's not just by reading the Bible a million times. It takes obedience. It takes obedience. That's the only time the Word of God becomes real, becomes, becomes be genuine in your heart. You understand it fully now. For me back then, before I learned to truly obey God, and of course I'm not perfect today, but at least I'm a little bit better than maybe 20 years ago, I praise God that I, I get to understand Him better. I get to understand the Word of God better. And it's not by reading the Bible all the hundred times. You, yes, I, 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 it's true, you need to read the Bible all the time if you can. But it takes obedience to know God. It takes obedience. And you know, I'm really blessed with some of you. Though you you, you, you haven't finished seminary education or, or, or some of you, you're, you're very new in your faith, but you're making an effort to teach someone else in, the, in Christ. Leading life groups. You're, you're, you're doing the job of a pastor. You're doing the job of a teacher. And I'm so blessed with that. Some of you are very young in your faith and you are now discipling someone else, sharing the gospel with someone else. You know, Billy Hanks, our, our, uh, the guy who wrote our discipleship material said this, you just need to be one chapter ahead. <laughs> when you, you know, don't, don't wait for the time when, oh Lord, I'll disciple when I'm mature and I'm gonna serve you when I learn a lot about you. Don't wait for that time to happen because if you're not going to do anything, you're not going to obey, it's not going to happen. The little you know starts, even if you know little about the Word of God, start sharing your faith. Start sharing the Gospel. Start discipling someone else. We just need to be one chapter ahead. We've been talking about God's royal court. So we're still, we're still in Revelation chapter 4. And... I'm talking about God's royal court. So why don't we go to that passage, Ariel, and let's just read again of this passage in Revelation 1, uh, Revelation 4, verse 1 to, to 11. And if you can read, of course, from there, read, read with me. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing up open in heaven, and a voice I heard first, heard speaking to me, like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this? And at once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven, with someone sitting on it. 
and the one who sat there had an appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone around, that shone like a, a, an emerald and circled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders, and they were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing, and these are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. At the center around the throne were four living creatures. They were covered with eyes, front and back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third was like the face of a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and, and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him, who sits on the throne, worship Him, who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. And the Lord bless the reading of His word. We learn of the members of the royal court of God. It includes God Himself, the 24 elders, the Holy Spirit, the four living creatures, and of course, not mentioned here, but in some other places in Scripture, Jesus is there. He is seated at the right hand of God in heaven. And last week, we talked about the 24 elders. You might have a lot of questions about the 24 elders, a lot of concerns maybe about my sermon. But there are a few things that's solid that we know, we understand fully what are these elders. Number one, they, we know that they have golden crowns and thrones, which signify that they rule and reign. You know, whenever you have a crown, and a, and a throne, it means ruling over a specific domain. And so these angels, or sorry, angels or humans, we don't know, the, you know, there's a lot of interpretation what this is. Could be angels, could be humans, or some other being. They, are, they have delegated responsibility to rule over God's domain. Their garments signify their holiness. And so being elders, it means that they are, they are, growing in their learning. They, they undergone a process of growth and maturity, growing in knowledge, growing in wisdom. They, they undergone this process. That's why they're elders. You know, even perfect beings needs to grow perfect in terms of holiness, but in terms of knowledge, they probably need to grow still. You know, Adam, even though he was perfect, sinless when God created him, he still needs to learn what it means to be God's, uh, you know, image bearer in the Garden of Eden and for the world, right? How, how, how he's going to uh, rule over all creation. And one of the things you notice about that we notice in this passage that they're in close proximity with God. They're very, they're very close. To, they're in, that, in the throne room itself. This reminds us of the 12 disciples. You know, the 12 disciples were always in close proximity with Jesus. In their process of learning, how did the disciple learn? about the teachings of Christ, it is by observing everything that Jesus said and did. That's why, you know, being in close proximity with Jesus is, is very vital for their spiritual maturity because that's how they learn. It's just by being with Jesus. Wherever Jesus went, wherever Jesus did His ministry, the disciples are always, always there. And what's the purpose for this? To, that they may they may become the foundation of the church. They heard God, Jesus called them to establish the church, foundation of the church, where Jesus is the chief chief cornerstone. You know that image of Jesus being the chief cornerstone and the disciples. It also remind, reminds us of the throne room in heaven, right? It reminds us of the throne room. You know, Carlo. I'm going to use Carlo as an example. Sorry, Carlo. <laughs> You know, he said one of his, this is what Carla said. She's, he's been sharing this as well. He said that one of the best discipleship moments uh, we have together 
is when we attend conferences uh, out, of, out of town, like we went to go to Dallas, or we go to Houston, or even I think when we went to Corpus Christi. So he said that's the, well, that's Pastor Al is saying that the, those are the best Bible, uh, what do you call this, discipleship moments. And, and he confessed that it's not really about the conference itself. Although we learn something from the conference, conference, but the biggest learnings that he has is when we're driving together for three hours and our conversations during those hours while driving. You know, I see, and, and uh, I would say that sometimes uh, we would go there, he is learning, and I don't know what's the reason why we, we go to the conference. Maybe it's just because of the free stuff as well. The, the, the giveaways during the conference. <laughs> but, but the truth is, uh, we are learning. You know, learning. He is learning. Uh, and being discipled through our time together. You know, Bien Lobrera, he is one of the authors of one of our materials. Uh, you know, by the way, we have three sets of discipleship material. We have the New Life Discipleship, we have the Call to Joy, and we have the Design for Discipleship. And there are different levels. You know, the New Life is the simplest. The, the, the Call to Joy is somewhere in the middle. Then you got Design for Discipleship, which is more advanced. But Bien Lobrera, who wrote this book, New Life Discipleship, I like what he said. He said the principle, the way Jesus discipled, is called the with him principle with him principle and i believe this is the best way to disciple someone by being with him with with her being with with a person who's going to disciple you and i think that that's what we did carlo and i when we were driving it's the with him principle of disciple and you know christian parents if you have a child who's a believer you are in the best position to disciple your child because your child is in close proximity to you. You know, Ephesians 5, 15, 15 tells us that, and this is talking to parents here, be careful in how you live, not as unwise. Be careful in how you live at home, not as unwise, but wise, making the most of every opportunity, meaning you glorify Christ in the presence of your children. You glorify Christ in the presence of your family. Show the nature of God. Show the love and goodness of God in the midst of your family. That's the best way to disciple your children. You know, have discipleship at home. By just living your life in such a way that glorifies God. I know it's not easy, especially at home, right? Because all the, all the, the sinful self will just come out at home by nature, by normally. <laughs> But I think this is what Paul was saying. In some other passages, he always reminds us to make every effort. To make every effort. Um, so another member of the of the of the royal court of God is the Holy Spirit. Member of God's royal court, hold the Holy Spirit. In this passage, we are he's described to be at the center, in front of the throne. So so there's the throne of God. And there are seven lamps in front. Seven. And that seven lamps represent the Holy Spirit. We talk about this in Revelation chapter 1. That the seven lamps stand represents the Holy Spirit. It talks about the perfection, the completeness of the Holy Spirit. In fact, in, uh, in, in, in Isaiah 11.2, describes seven different attributes of the Holy Spirit or nature or ministry of the Holy Spirit. That he is the spirit of wisdom, one. He is the spirit of understanding, spirit of counsel, spirit of strength, spirit of knowledge, spirit of reverence or respect or fear of God. And of course, he is God. And that seventh lamb, it does not tell us that there are seven different Holy Spirit. There's only one Holy Spirit. But it describes the nature of the Holy Spirit. Remember in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came from heaven like a wind... <laughs> And, and like a strong wind and came to this upper room and, and filled every person there. What does the Bible say? What, what happened next? There was, there was like a tongue, tongues of flame on the heads of every disciple there. And there were 120 of them. 
in that upper room, 120. So therefore, there are 120 tongues of tongues of fire. They look like tongue, you know, probably. That's why it's called tongues of fire. And each of the each of them had a tongue of fire on their head. Does it mean that there are 120 Holy Spirits? There's only one Holy Spirit. And that tongue of fire is the evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit in every person's life, but there's only one Holy Spirit. One nature of the Holy Spirit that's worth noting from Revelation chapter 4. I always thought, you know, we, 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 we instinctively know this, and we know this from Scripture, that the reason why we don't see spiritual things, we don't see angels, because we, we have physical bodies, we have physical eyes. So, so our physical being is able only to sense physical things. We're all in agreement to that, right? That our physical eyes is only able to see physical things. Uh, that's really the limitation of our physical bodies. We cannot see spiritual beings. But, uh, but we know that, uh, that our spirit, and, and later on when our spirit leaves our body, we begin to be able to see spiritual things. And that is why I believe that once we leave this body or once we're out of the body, in, in our spirit form, we can probably see angels. Obviously, we can see angels and we can, of course, see God and see spiritual things. But I, I'm just amazed that even in this scene in heaven, John is not able to see the Holy Spirit in, a, in, a, in the way he sees the elders and, and, the, and God's throne. He's not able to see the Spirit that way. So I believe the Spirit, whether in the physical realm or in the spiritual realm, He is still invisible. That exa that's exactly what Jesus said in, in John 3, that the Spirit is like the wind. You cannot see the Spirit. You cannot, you cannot uh, physically, you know, in a, some sense, experience Him. But you know His impact. You know the effect of His work. You know the things that He's doing. The results accomplished by His presence. You know that. Although you cannot see Him. Jesus describes Him like the wind. One application, the important application for us on this topic on the Holy Spirit before we move to the living creatures is that we as believers we need to have a constant awareness of the Holy Spirit we need to have a constant awareness of the Holy Spirit his presence and his work in our lives and in, in, in this world you know the God the Father what Jesus said God the Father is always at work he's always at work and, and Jesus said my responsibility is to look at what God is doing and I'm gonna join him in what he is doing. That's what Jesus said. God the Father is always at work. Jesus is always at work. The Spirit is also the same. He is dynamic. He is constantly in action. He is always working. He's always speaking. He always directs. He, he always works in the lives of people, in your life, in the life of people around you. And people who are who are meant to hear the gospel, meant to, for salvation, he is working. And, and for those who are hard-hearted, He's going to work in their hearts to bring, you know, humility, repentance, openness towards the gospel. The Spirit is always at work in us, around us, in this world. But what's, what's the issue we're experiencing right now? What's the issue? Uh, the issue is that we're not listening to Him. We're not sensitive to Him. We're not aware of Him. Our responsibility is to be able to hear the spirit that is our responsibility so to hear him and how do we do that how we do how do we do that i'm gonna I'm, am i gonna just say oh hey spirit speak to me i want to hear you i want to hear you oh lord speak louder lord so that i can hear you that's not what the bible says what the bible says is that we are not to quench the spirit we are not to grieve the spirit meaning our heart should not be filled with any kind of guilt or sin that will prevent the Spirit from speaking to you. Because the Bible talks about quenching and grieving the Spirit. And when He is quenched and grieved, you're not going to be able to hear from Him. And so, if it's your desire to be able to constantly hear the Spirit. This is what God convicted me this week during my devotion. It's not only Carlo that has... Uh, 
amazing devotion. I also have amazing devotion, Scarlett. According to Ephesians 2, uh, three things that God reminded me this week, and I'm going to encourage you that make this your commitment. Uh, three things. This is based on Ephesians 2. Number one, do not gratify the cravings of your sinful nature. Make that commitment. As you wake up in the morning, I will not gratify the cravings of my sinful nature. Second, do not follow the ways of the world. And third, do not follow the ruler of the kingdom of the air, Satan. Every time you watch a movie that is, so there's evil there, there's, it's obvious that there's some witchcraft in there, you are following the ways of Satan. It's a promotion of Satan and you're enjoying his, his, his advertisements or something. Make this commitment. Do not gratify the cravings of your sinful nature. Do not follow the ways of the world. Do not follow the ruler of the kingdom of the earth. And there, if there's no guilt, if your heart is, is free from any kind of guilt and sin, confess all your sins, and you're walking in righteousness, then you will be able to hear the Spirit speak. You will be able to hear Him constantly. last the last group of beings in this passage in chapter 4 of revelation as, this, as listed by john are the four living creatures are the four living creatures the elders their primary responsibility is to serve god service but as you look at this four Living creatures, their primary responsibility before God is what? Worship. Worship. Worship of God. Worship of God Himself. And this is a case, I would say, you know, I said before that there's only a few verses in the Bible that talks about praise and worship. But you know, this is a support for the, for, for the job of the worship leader. Because these living creatures are actually worship leaders. <laughs> or music leaders. Uh, you're not going to grow any wings soon, so don't worry. <laughs> or your face is going to turn into a lion or something, don't worry. <laughs> You know, these four living creatures, they're not unique to Revelation. They're already revealed in the Old Testament, even in greater detail. We don't, we're not going to go through these passages today. I encourage you to look it up as well, write it down, because uh, it's interesting what you read in those passages. But I'm going to summarize what I got from those passages. What I did is I put together a table from all the passages in Scripture, and I went through throne, 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 throne. What does Ezekiel talks about say about the throne? What does Ezekiel 10 says about the throne? What does Revelation say about the throne? I have also another portion there talking about the four living creatures and look at their description from across the Bible. So I, it's a long discussion, but I, I'll have a summary later. <laughs> so it's found in Ezekiel 1. They're found in Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 10, and, and Isaiah 6. And there are slight differences in the description in Ezekiel 1, 10, and Isaiah 6. There are slight dis dis differences. And I believe, and I've been reading some commentators, even, even well-known pastors and commentators about this, that they believe, and I believe, that these are the same beings. The beings that was described in Ezekiel 1, the beings that was described in Ezekiel 10 and Isaiah 6, they're the same beings. And I believe the reason why there's slight differences in their description Imagine yourself in that situation. Imagine yourself seeing the throne of God, seeing the throne room, and seeing those creatures before you. They're full of fire. You're probably half scared. At the same time, you are in fear of God's presence. That's God there. And this is something that you haven't seen in your life. These creatures that have six wings, eyes all over the body head like a lion I don't know what you're gonna feel there and these are probably huge beings how can you write about that <laughs> for me if I'll, I'll be in that situation I'm probably gonna collapse <laughs> uh, 
old Bowie dropped to the ground. And it's going to be a challenging thing to describe this for all these prophets. You know, these beings, I, 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 you know, King James described this as, the King James Version describes these beings as beasts. I don't think it's accurate description because the original Greek talks about the word for these beings is, is the word the word life comes from. So I think that's why it's better to describe this as living beings because these are not animals. You know, these are not animals. These are intelligent, angelic beings of the highest order. These are angels of the highest order. They're right there at the very throne of God. Let me read to you again. Starting at verse 6. In the center around the throne were four living creatures. They were covered with eyes in front and back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face of a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each, had four, uh, each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around. So even the wings, there were eyes in the wings. Even under the wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, worshiping God's holiness. You know, I attempted to do just a sketch. This is just a sketch because I, I wish I could make this look nicer. But, but this is just my idea on, I think, how it looks like. Because I tried to look at many pictures from the past and present on how these things look like. And I, they didn't look majestic. They, they looked puny or something like that. And so I, I wanted a more majestic version of this kind of creature, like more regal or, or regal or something. And the eyes, some, sometimes they draw like really eyes on those wings and it looks very scary. Like you know, an eye here blinking somewhere, oh, that's not good. <laughs> but, but for me, I would say it probably looks like more like a peacock's uh, feather where there's some eye and it looks so nice, right? Because these creatures, these beings were one of the most, in fact, the most beautiful beings of God's creation. Beautiful beings, you'll find out later. These are the most beautiful beings. And they're probably gonna look, they're probably look really, really amazing. Imagine the peacock's feather that looks like eyes and all over their body on the wings. And I think there's, there, there's flesh, there, their body was probably, there's some kind of beads there that looks like eyes as well. That's why both, uh, you know, the Old Testament prophets in John talks about eyes all around. But they look like, that's why I tried to do s circles there, like eye looking around their body. And there's, and so this is my attempt. <laughs> and of course, I only did the lion. I didn't do the, do the eagle and the others. But let me just give you a summary on what the description of these beings across all those passages. Uh, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and John. There's four of them, four of them around the throne of God, one standing in front of the throne, at the center in front, one on the left side, one on the right side, and one on the back. So there's four of them around, basically, around the throne of God. And they have six wings. Uh, there was one account that talks about four wings. Let's just say four to six wings. Yes, they have wings. Two wings used for flying. Two to cover the, the feet. John says, uh, you know, uh, one passage says to cover the body some. One, another passage says to cover the feet. And, and another to cover the face. So that's why there's six. Cover the face, cover the feet. I, I just made it big so you can cover both body and feet just in case which one works. And also, um, they're around the throne of God in close proximity to the throne. And so, it's understandable, we can understand the purpose of these wings. Because God's glory is so powerful. And you know, you cannot look at the glory of God unveiled. Moses had to hide himself from the, from the glory of God. And I believe these creatures, these living creatures, when they're worshiping in close proximity to God, they have to cover their faces because they cannot look at God unveiled because of His holiness and greatness and power. And the, 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 the covering of their feet, because they're standing, John MacArthur says this, that he said, you know, because they're standing on, 
holy ground. That's holy ground, being in heaven. Of course, that's heaven. <laughs> nothing is holy. There's nothing anywhere in the in all creation is holy as that place in the very presence of God. And 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 also they are described as having a body of a man, bronze legs, feet like a calf. I didn't have time to put the feet of a calf, so that's why I covered it. So, you know, of an ox or something, bronze-like skin. It's amazing. Can you imagine that? <laughs> and the body is flaming like torches of fire. And they're fast. They're really fast. They move like lightning when they move from one place to another. Move like lightning. The sound of their wings was like the sound of many waters. Imagine the sound of waterfalls. Like, sound of waterfalls that's the sound that you hear when they when they just move their wings the sound of many waters it's like the sound of waterfall and they have the hands of a man I, I there's a, a bit conf some confusion in the passage because one passage seemed to say that they got four hands I just put two hands because probably looks scary to have four hands uh, their eyes were all around Many of the commentators I read, and this is a seem to be a good explanation of the eyes. You know, the eyes could be fist could be functional eyes, or it could be just design, right? It could be just a design that John thought there were eyes, but was the design of their wings. There's a you know feature make it more prettier, but it could be also functional eyes. We, we cannot really tell. But the meaning of these eyes symbolizes that these beings are fully aware. They have thorough knowledge of their responsibility. They know well what they're supposed to do. They were fully aware. And there's fiery coals under the throne, stones, fiery, co uh, fiery stones. And one feature that is common across these passages is that there are four different faces. One is the face of a lion, the other is the face of an ox, Third one is a face of a man, and the last one is a face of an eagle. So different kinds of faces. The only difference is in John, he talks about just one face. Each being, they have one face, like lion, the other one is an eagle, the other one is an ox, the other one is a, is a man. But in, uh, in Ezekiel, it talks about four faces. Like each being has four faces. One head, but four faces. Like man, maybe lion, maybe ox, maybe eagle on the back. I mean, different kinds of faces. Just check the Bible on where the position was. I, I wasn't I didn't remember off, my, off the top of my head. But there were four different faces in one head. It's, it's going to be scary <laughs> looking, but, but these are the most beautiful of God's creation. And, and this, the four faces, there's a lot of you know, different meanings to this. We cannot really pinpoint what these four different faces mean. One, the face of a lion, what does it mean? You know, some. Some, some scholars or commentators believe that it could mean Israel, like you know, the tribe of uh, the tribe of of uh, Reuben is the image of a man. The tribe of Dan is the image of an eagle. The tribe of uh, of Ephraim is the image of an ox, and Judah, of course, the lion, tribe of Judah. But some also say that this probably is the gospel because because the lion. Is an image of a king, so it refers to Matthew, the, the four Gospels, by the way, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So lion is Matthew because Jesus is refer is is being revealed as a king. Mark, ox because Jesus is being revealed as a servant. Luke, man, because Jesus is revealed as a human. Jesus in his humanity. Then John is revealed as an eagle because God, Jesus is God. Reveals Jesus died deity. And lastly, just in relation to this list of descriptions from the different uh, books in the Bible that describes this being, in Ezekiel chapter 10, they are described, uh, they, they are named as this being. They're named the cherubim. So this being is what a cherubim looks like. A cherub. And Revelation tells us that day and night they worship God they sing the song, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Let me say this. This is what I thought when I read this long time ago, even recently. I thought that these beings, 
this is what they do 24 by 7 non-stop for eternity they're just singing holy 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 non-stop forever but it's not the case uh, it's not the case if you read the rest of the revelation of revelation you find that these beings these four living creatures they have other responsibilities they actually are involved in the tribulation in the tribulation they have certain roles during the tribulation and and I, I, I like to change your thinking of this because I know some people, they, they say this without even understanding heaven and the Bible. They say, oh, in heaven, we're going to just worship God 24 by 7, 100% of the time, forever and ever. I mean, we're just going to be singing praise and worship there nonstop forever. I don't think that's what we're going to do in heaven 100% of the time. Sorry for the singers. But, but those who are, who are mga sintonado and not singers, they're very happy. Like, yay! <laughs> So we're not going to be singing there 24 by 7 in heaven because you're going to have a lot of other responsibilities there. Um, when the Bible says day and night, you notice several times in scripture, meditate on the word day and night. See, Paul, when he prayed for the Thessalonians, he said, I've been praying for you day and night. Does it mean that Paul is praying 24 by 7 nonstop? It means that there is a season where Paul prays like that. And he constantly remembers the Thessalonians day and night. It, it means that he, he, he spends time in this prayer. But he also has other responsibilities, of course. Oh. So, so this, this worshiping day and night here, nonstop, it's a season of worship. Because, because these beings have other responsibilities. They have other responsibilities. And... and and these beings, they lead the worship in heaven. They lead the worship in heaven. Because what you notice in the next part of this passage, later part in the passage, it says here, each of the living creatures had six wings, covered uh, with eyes all around, even under the wings. They never stopped saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is, and is to come. They're worshiping God's holiness. They were leading the, 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 the inhabitants of heaven in worship. Because after he, they sang this song, in, 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 seven, in verse 9, whether it was song or a chant, um, they were leading in worship. In, in verse 9, whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and praise to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fell down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay down their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our God, our Lord and God. To receive glory and honor and power for you have created you have created all things and by your will i like what the king james said here by your pleasure by your joy that they were created and have their being it reveals why god created all of us we were created for his pleasure by his pleasure and not only that after they after this four being led the worship, began to worship the worship by singing the first song, Holy, 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 the elders sang their song and responded. If you're going to read verse 5, we're going to study verse 5 next week. As you go to verse 5, all the angels began singing. Then all the inhabitants of heaven and earth began singing. Like, like there was a chain reaction, starting with these four beings, then the elders, then the angels, millions of angels, then inhabitants of heaven and earth. Even the, the redeemed, the saints, started worshiping. But it was but this four being began the worship, began the singing, the worship process. Um, as they, they were the, they're the ones who led the worship. You know, the royal court in heaven, I don't think they are just there all the time singing, sitting down. Jesus, the being, oh, sorry, God the Father and and of course the 24 elders i don't think they're all, all they're there sitting down 24 by 7 because Re daniel 7 tells us that this was a meeting we talked about it last last week this was a meeting this was a court session the royal court session the way they came together for a purpose they came for the, together for a purpose and that is and that is to present before the royal court the one who is worthy to open the scroll which we're going to learn in Revelation 5 that Jesus is going to be presented before this royal court before the elders before the four living creatures of course before the ancient of days that he is the only one worthy to open the scroll 
So that was the purpose of this meeting. You know, I, I, for those of you who work, who are working in the corporate in world, you know, you always have meetings, right? Um, I, you know, those meetings in, in the corp, if you're in the corporate uh, world, you know, so they can be classified into two kinds of meetings. Uh, this is what we learned when back in my job before. You know, they, it's, meetings can be classified as mission meetings or process meetings. You know, if you have a mission meeting, the meeting has a purpose, it's a goal. You, you want to accomplish something, you're gonna fix a problem, or there's a solution that needs to be figured out. That's why you have that meeting, right? You have mission meetings in your in your workplace, right? Especially if there are problems going on at work, then let's all meet, let's figure this out. So that's a mission meeting. But there's also meetings that are called process meetings where you just come into the meeting and you just tell the manager, hey, this is what's going on. Uh, and the advisor said, good, okay. The manager will say, yeah, yeah good, good. Or, so it's just giving updates. So you're just giving updates of the process, what's going on with the project or something. So. So mission meeting and process meeting. You know, in God's royal court, there is also that. <laughs> you know, this is probably a more of a mission meeting, but if you read the story of Job, that was more like a process meeting where all the angels, all the, in fact, it's described as the sons of God, they are all presenting themselves to the father before God, you know, giving updates on their domain. So at the end of this meeting in Daniel 7, of course, the court was adjourned. And they have to go off probably to do something else. Like in your case, in your meetings. You know, the, your real work is not in the meeting, right? You don't go to meet. Most of the time, you don't do really all the work in the meeting. You just, you're just giving work. You're going to say, okay, this is what you're going to do well. Then after the meeting, that's where you start, start working, right? So that's why I don't think, uh, in fact, in just a practical speculation on my part that I don't think God and the 24 elders, they're sitting on those thrones for all eternity, 24 by 7. I don't think that's really the case. Just like Jesus, how he cared for his disciples. They ate, they fellowship, they had good times, and, you know, enjoyed time with one another, with one another. they do ministry together, and also that Jesus taught them. So there's this variety of activities. So one, one thing, a few, few more things before we end. This cherubim is the same being that was placed at the entrance of the Garden of Eden to guard the entrance after Adam and Eve fell. And also this cherubim, Satan was one of this. Satan was one of these creatures before the fall, before he fallen, he, before, before his, his fall. Let me read to you Ezekiel 28. This is a description of Satan. But it wasn't really a description of the king of Tyre, but it's a prophecy allusion to Satan. Ezekiel 28, 13 to 15. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, the diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, the car carbon, is it carbon kel? And gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and thy pipes were prepared in thee in the day of thou was in the day and this is King James that thou was created. Then verse fourteen, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou was walked upon the midst of the stones of fire. Let's read this translation here. You are anointed as the guardian cherub. For so I ordained you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You work among the fiery stones. Remember talking about the fiery stones under the throne of God that, that these creatures have access? Satan walked among those stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till, the, till wickedness has found you. Let me correct that. Lucifer walked among those stones before he became Satan. Last statement. Let's go. 15. Thou was perfect. And King James again. That was I like the I like the way the King James says these words here. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that were that was created till iniquity 
found you. Whew. I don't know with you. It's just unthinkable to think that Satan was this close to God. He is, the Bible says he is. We know, a lot of you knows that Satan is the direct, some kind of a director in music. Makes sense, right? Because he was the worship leader. One of the worship leaders there. And he was beautiful because these creatures are one of the greatest, uh, you know, most beautiful, I'm saying, most beautiful creatures that God created. It's just unthinkable. But both us and these angels, they have the free will to obey or disobey God. They have the free will to do that as well. So that is why I believe there's probably more cherubims than the four. There's more cherubims, of course. Because you got the angel in charge of protecting the Garden of Eden, so making short na yung apat dun. <laughs> if Satan left, then you know there will not be enough throne guardians, guardian angels. So, what can we learn about these angels in application? You know, there's a lot of things we can know about God from these angels, but there are four things I would like to just use in closing that reveals of God's desire for any being, whether angels or for us as, Christian, as uh, believers, followers of Christ, as humans. This is God's desire. Just going to get some four things from these angels. Number one, God desires us to be in close proximity with Him. To be with Him. Just like we were talking earlier about the with Him principle, where I'm being with a person, discipling like my discipleship with Carlo, that we spend time together and discipleship. This is what God desires for us, to, that for us to be with Him. And when that does happen, when does this thing happen? It happens when you're in prayer, when you are in fellowship with God during your time in His Word, when you are in His presence in prayer. Because the Bible tells us that you are to come to His throne of grace. Whenever you're coming and come to prayer in God, you are actually entering into His throne of grace into His very presence through Jesus Christ. God desires that. He wants that. He desires our fellowship. He desires our, our presence close pro in, in close proximity with Him, just like His angels. Another thing we can learn from these angels, God desires unceasing prayer and worship. You know, and I, I believe this church already understands this because some of you, you shared this to me that oh, I'm already learning now what it means to unceasingly pray. I'm, I'm so glad that, that many of you already understand this. It's not about walking around and closing your eyes and folding your hands and, and, and going to the mall. So nice bag, and you're going to go again like this. You know, it's not like that. I, 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 I know you're, especially when driving, that's not a good thing. But you understand that it is a constant awareness of God, constant communion, constant communication, even worship, even worship in your heart recognizing god you're holy lord thank you for your goodness that i just you just saved me from this near miss accident lord thank you for your protection lord god every moment every opportunity you have you are in constant communication just like these angels holy 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 lord god almighty it can be a daily moment by moment thing for us third thing god desires us to be fully aware alert in his presence this is something probably you haven't heard before God wants us to be fully aware, alert in His presence, just like His angels. How many times in your prayer where you're not even thinking what you're saying? <laughs> Worship leaders, or some leaders standing in front of you here, when you're encouraging, encouraging the church, how many times where you're talking and you're not actually thinking what you're saying? Just words just come out of your mouth without even really thinking what you're saying. You know, sometimes in prayer, you know, I notice this in our prayer. Sometimes when we pray, sometimes we repeat words over and over. Like we say, Lord God, uh, let's say, let's say, God, I pray for healing. Uh, oh God. Lord, I pray for your blessing. Oh God. <laughs> sometimes we keep on repeating the same praises over and over without even really thinking, is this really how I should be talking to God? The way you talk to your friends, family, you know, you're very intelligent. Very, uh, it's, it can be understood. And I think we need to be alert and aware, aware when we are in God's presence. When we talk to Him, make sure your every word means some, 
there's meaning in it. It means really from your heart. It comes from your heart. You understand what you're saying. So your prayer doesn't have to be very long, number one. It doesn't have to have repeat a lot of repeated stuff. And you don't have to talk without breathing. <laughs> you can pause and, and, and think about what you're going to say next. Because sometimes we're not really, we're prone to just pray, say things, because we're used to saying things that way. Now we have to begin praying with a full awareness of every word we're going to say, everything we're going to, be, we're going to talk to God about. And I think God will be, will, will find joy, find pleasure in that kind of prayer. That you're fully aware you really know what you're saying. You're just repeating things out of, you know, out of memory or out of habit. Out of habit. Lastly, God desires reverence. God desires reverence when we worship. We need to be constantly aware that the only reason why we are able to come to God is because of His grace and mercy only because of his grace and mercy and we cannot be arrogant before God's presence we cannot be disrespectful before God's presence some people say oh you know come here best friend come in God no that's being that's I know God is our father I know God loves us but you should not use that as an excuse or you should not use that as a as a just to, you know to disrespect God that kind that relationship as a, as a means to disrespect him to be irreverent Imagine this, angels, they are holy in the presence of God, but they still recognize God's holiness. They were reverent before God, knowing that when they come before God, they are standing on holy ground. They are in the presence of, 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 of God Almighty. And they will even cover their faces with the, with the wings. And for us, when we come to, 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 to our devotional time, meron pang muta sometimes maybe, or ano ba? Uh, I'm not saying that you have to take a bath but at least you know it's not about appearance of course but but be fully awake be fully awake may coffee ka dyan meron kang may konting uh, papagising <laughs> you know something to keep you awake and alert when you're spending time with God because you are sitting or standing on holy ground so, when you're in the presence of God, be like this cherubim, constantly close to His, close to Him, to His presence, close proximity to God, unceasing prayer, unceasing worship, fully aware of what you're going to say, fully aware of your worship, and a heart that reveres God, reverence for God, respect for God, hindi hindi flippant, hindi disrespectful. Let's pray. Almighty Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord. So much of God, amazing things we can learn from Revelation, oh God. That even, Lord, the time we have today is not enough to cover all this, Lord. But Lord, thank you that in the time that we have, we learn from you, Lord. I've learned from you, Lord God, through this book, Lord God. Lord, I ask you to Encourage my brothers and sisters, Lord, to live lives that is holy and pleasing before you. Lord, not giving themselves to the desires of the sinful nature. Lord, not giving themselves to the, to the desires of this world, the things of this world, Lord. There are a lot of things this world entices us with, oh God. Lord, help us to resist, Lord God, the temptations of this world. And also, Lord, the temptations of Satan, Lord. That we will have nothing to do, Lord, with the works of darkness, O God. That we will have nothing to do, Lord, whatever Satan sells to us, O God. Lord, we don't want to quench your Holy Spirit, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, if ever, if ever, Lord God, we have quenched your Spirit. We have grieved your Spirit because of our arrogance, because of our pride, O God, because of our sin, Lord God. Whether it's the, in the flesh or even in our heart, O God. Forgive us, Lord. 
Lord, we want to be able to hear you speak to us, lead us, direct us every moment, every day, Lord God. That's our desire. Because we want to experience the fullness of life you promised to us, Lord. All the spiritual blessings that you, you promised to us. We want all this, oh God. And I do pray, oh God, that whenever we come before you, Lord God, in your presence, that we'll be reverent, we'll be respectful, oh God. We will recognize that we are in the presence of the creator of heaven and earth. God who created all things. God who brought, who sent his son to us. Jesus Christ, our Savior, to bring salvation to, to, him, to, the human, to humankind, oh God, to all of us, Lord. Yes, sir. Lord, we pray that we will not neglect, oh God, our time with you, to live in close proximity with you every day when we come to you in prayer, to unceasingly worship you, Lord God, pray, oh God, and that make every effort, oh God, make the most of every opportunity, oh God, make use why our time Make use of our time wisely, Lord. I do pray, O oh God, for this in our church, O oh God. And Lord, help us to be fully aware of what we say, O oh God, when we pray. Yes, Lord. That we will not be, Lord God, on our, on our mind, I mean, Lord, will not, will not be all over the place. We'll be focused, O oh God, that we know what we're saying is really from our heart. And it is what our mind and our heart tells us and we'll speak of it, O God, for your throne. We're fully awake, fully aware, just like this cherubims, O God, before your throne, around your throne, Lord. Lord, thank you for the lives of my brothers and sisters. I thank you for their love and their, even their patience of, of being here today and the joy of, uh, and, the, and the, Lord, commitment to be here today, Lord God, is Sunday, Lord. Thank you for the commitment of those who are listening online. Lord, that they're able to listen to us today, Lord. Ask your blessing upon their lives, O oh God, your protection. And then upon all of us as we continue to weather this storm, O oh God, this pandemic that has been you know, affecting all of us for these past several months now, Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord, fill us with renewed hope, renewed joy, and strength as we face another week. We ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. I'm going to ask, ask Brother Roel and, um, yes, Roel or Joy, maybe, or, um, maybe the entire family. To, well, I would like us to pray for them as Roel prepares his travel for the Philippines tomorrow. Uh, you know, the challenges there. And... Um, and also the situation of uh, the passing of his of his dad. And I would like also to Jen and and, and Joy, Jenny and Joy to come forward. I would like I would like to pray for you as well. If there's anyone here who who needs prayer, and you can just tell me here in front what we need to pray for. Uh, you can come forward as well. I, I would like to use this time to close it for you for us to pray for you. And Carlo as well. Uh, if there's anyone else uh, who needs prayer, let's use this uh, time to pray for them. I think this is a good time to, for us to do this. Let me start with Roel, Joy, and Kim. Why don't you help pray with me on this? Father God, Lord, thank you for your love, oh God. The love that has been consistent and faithful, O oh God, and Lord, even though sometimes we are in our deepest struggle, O oh God, you are there, O oh God. Just like what David said, that even we lay our bed in the depths, depths O oh God, you are there. And Lord, in the midst of, midst of this loss, O oh God, and grief, O oh God, for the Brutus family, Lord God, you are with them, Lord. You are there, Lord. You are loving them, encouraging them, Lord God, providing for their needs. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And I I can testify to that, and Roel and Joy can testify to that, Lord, that you are faithful and providing everything they need in these times of struggle. And thank you for answering their prayers, Lord, even the even the dual citizenship. Thank you for that, Lord. That's an amazing, amazing miracle, Lord, from you. Lord, Lord as this family, especially for Roel and Kelsey, Lord, as they travel, oh God, we ask for your protection, oh God, and, and even as they travel, you know, the restrictions and the challenges in the Philippines, Lord. 
I pray that they will be able to go through it successfully, Lord, that they don't have to stay long in Manila, and Lord, that they'll be able to be at their destination, to be at the wake uh, of their of funeral of their of Lowell's dad, Lord. And Lord, I pray that everything will go well and, and good, oh God, for Lowell and the family and all the things they plan to do, Lord. But I do pray also, Lord, that you will use Lowell, you will use Kelsey, Lord, you will use them as vessels of honor, that, that you, you will be glorified in this in this gathering, in this reunion, Lord. Lord, I ask in Jesus' name, oh God, that, that Lord, that through, the, through this uh, uh, wake of the funeral, oh God, that many will come to know you, Lord, as Lord and Savior. Lord, you know that the world's dad is a pastor, oh God, and, and there are many believers there as well. Lord, use them, oh God, in Jesus' name, oh God. Lord, that, that you will be glorified, that people will come to know Christ. And Lord, even though this is a, a time of grief, but Lord, you know that even in the times of mourning, there is joy, oh God. Especially for the soul of a believer who is now in you in heaven, Lord God. The angels are rejoicing in his, waiting his arrival, oh God. And Lord, that's why we can still find joy in the means of grief. grief oh God. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, for the life of royal joy. We came here, God. Lord God, thank you for your protection and blessing in Jesus' name. Let's pray for Jenny and Joy. Some, some of you know that Jenny and Joy they lost their brother recently, and they're, they're still grieving, and in pain, hurting for them. Lord God, I live and be my sisters, Lord. Jen and Joy and Andre, oh God, the rest of the family, especially their mom, Lord, in the Philippines. Lord, I pray first of all that you comfort them in the time of this loss and grief, oh God. Lord, I also pray that you grant the desires of their heart and only that you comfort them but meet their needs, Lord. Lord, help them, oh God, to be able to send, oh God, their, their uh, a gen son, oh God, to be with their mom who's alone in the Philippines. Open the way for that to happen soon, Lord. Lord, your mom needs your protection, your care, oh God. So, Lord, protect her. Take care of her, oh God, if we need someone, Lord, from their neighbors to care for her. Lord, provide the care that's needed for their mom who's out there. And I pray, meet their desires, oh God. Answer Mark to be able to go home, Lord. And Lord, I pray for peace in their heart. But Lord, that even in the midst of this loss of God, Lord, there is hope, there is joy in you, a joy that's much deeper, much stronger than the grief of God. Lord, and above all, use this, O God, Lord, that this moment, so God, for them to, to see you, to know your will. Lord, there's really nothing our humanity, Lord, that we can do to comfort uh, Jen, Lord. But in you, Lord God, nothing is impossible. With you, nothing is impossible. And you are able to take hold of their heart, of their mind, of their situation, oh God, and turn it around, oh God, and bring this peace and joy in the midst of the grief, oh God, that, that uh, Lord, that, that, only, that only you alone can provide, oh God. Thank you, Lord. Take care of them, Lord. Lord, once again, answer their desire. For Mark, Mark to be able to go home in Jesus' name. Amen. And lastly, let's pray for Carla. Yes. Carla, let's come here. Anyone else? No. No, let's let's pray for Carla. Carla, just matter. Mother just mother just passed. Her mother just passed away, and, and I know she was the one who raised you up, right? Let us pray. Lord, thank you for this young man, oh God. Lord, how much. You have used him, O oh God, all these years. How you are transforming his life, O oh God, more and more into the likeness of Christ. Lord, continue to strengthen Carla, Lord, as you have always done. He has gone through a lot of trials, O oh God, personally, health-wise, family, Lord, and this, and this, O oh God, uh, the passing of his grandma, Lord. Lord, I pray, O oh God, that you grant him the strength to deal with this in your own strength and power, Lord. Just as, the, just as the same as the prayer of God that I have for, you know, for Joy and Noel and Jen and Joy, Lord God. And Lord, I pray for Carla, Lord, that 
that your joy, your strength will be, O oh God, even in the midst, midst of all this grief, O oh God. Lord, I pray that you will grow stronger in you, Lord, even in the midst of this struggle. Lord, I also pray for blessing upon his family, you know, the struggles they have, Lord. Lord, help them through this difficult times that we're going through right now as a family, Lord. That the day will come that all these struggles they're going through will be, will be resolved, Lord. And I pray for Carlo that you raise him up, grant him your wisdom, even as he leads the young adults ministry, Lord. It's a challenging journey, Lord, for Carlo, Lord. I can see that, Lord. But give him the strength. We as a church just entrust him to you. Let you supply him with all wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and even maturity, Lord. And even victory, oh God, over his personal struggle, whether it's sin or, or even, Lord God, his lack of courage. He will overcome all this, oh God, and Lord, be able to truly and confident, with confidence in you, Lord God. Serve the young adults ministry, Lord, with all wisdom and the power that comes from you. I just entrust his life unto you. Lord. Thank you, Lord. That you will be able, he's able to do this because you will supply and work out the strength that is needed to them. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Amen. Um, I pray that all of you make sure that you greet one another, uh, even just like that. Or something. No? Huh? Or fist bump, fist, back of the fist bump, or something. And also, I think we have a first timer. What's what's her name? John or hello? She's been here before. Oh, you've been here before? Yes. Oh, oh, I thought I thought I thought there was a guest. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I cannot hear very well. So, well, thank you for being here and welcome to those who are here for the first time. I hope you join us again uh, next time. And also, those who are online watching, if you're from Austin, join us here. Uh, you know, this is a very nice place. The wind is so nice. Uh, the weather is so good. It's like the perfect weather today. Like, like I would say, for me, it's still 75, right? It's a perfect temperature for me. Uh, and so, as we end our service, uh, can I ask Carla to come forward for uh, uh, for the announcements? Then we'll dismiss. Thank you for your, uh, that lesson. So, just like what Pastor Al said, so if you have some question, uh, even though you're here also in uh, the on-site or online, um, join and go to www.riverlifeaustin.org in both parts. And you'll get some information in there too if you want to join some live groups and answer up some questions, which is in the next slide. So within the week, we have this uh, ministries. It's like I said last time, I'm going to say this last time, I think on the kids. So men's uh, on Wednesday, 6 p.m. Again, I encourage you, when you're, even though you're not a dad and, you know, or you're just married, single man, just attend because it's really encouraging i attended the last week and it's really encouraging it's not really only for dads uh the young adults are um we're gonna record our um i'm gonna restart our meeting again this thursday so it's on um 7 p.m ladies uh thursday at 7 30 p.m youths uh every friday at 7 p.m and the kids are not uh doing their online zoom anymore they're actually doing their in-person Sunday school, which is like right now. It's the they have they are doing their Sunday school in uh, inside, and on the first and third or the odd number of weeks, they're here on site with us. Next one is our birthday celebrants this week. So Jad, uh, birthday is after tomorrow. Jad, uh, Jared Espiritu Santo, he used to come here. Bernice, Bernice. Yeah. happy birthday, Bernice. Jack or Ate Jacqueline Kyo, happy birthday. Yes. And that's it, I think, this week. Amen to that. Amen. God bless us all. Amen and amen.